everybody. It's Dr. Achina Stein, and we are um, recording an interview with uh, Dr. Rika Milanovic Gilbraith. Um, and she is one of my closest friends uh, and colleague. And uh, she is a functional medicine uh, doctor, uh, physician in family medicine. And she and I worked together uh, back in, gosh, it was what, 2013, 2014, 2015, for a couple of years at Visions Healthcare. Those of you who know about Visions Healthcare, um, that's where we worked. And let me just tell you a little bit about her. Dr. Rika has been successfully leading women and their families to optimal health for over two decades as a board certified family medicine doctor from delivering babies to managing a family care in the clinic and in hospital. And now she's exclusively leading a functional medicine consultant uh, certified by the Institution for Functional Medicine. I think I just messed that up, <laughs> sorry. She is an international speaker, facilitator, and mentor to practitioners and has trained dozens of practitioners in functional medicine. And having overcome two autoimmune illnesses herself, uh, along with debilitating fatigue, um, she's gonna give us firsthand knowledge and empathy for the challenges that face her patients. And as a woman and an entrepreneur, she's passionate about empowering women leaders to optimal health. Her ultimate goal is to empower women to optimal health and in turn have them empower their families and their tribes to optimal health. She has expertise in resolving brain fog and environmental illness. And she also has expertise in genetics and nutrigenetics. And she sees patients at her clinic that she founded called Simple Health Institute outside of Chicago, Illinois. Welcome, Rika. So good to have you, my soul sister. <laughs> Thanks for that lovely uh, introduction, Achina. It's so good. It feels like we're almost we're back in the same place. So. <laughs> <laughs> I wish we were. I would love it if we practiced again together. Maybe we will in the future or online. You know, that's what we got to put those uh, energy dreams out there. <laughs> That is the ultimate goal. I, as we, I, we had both said and noticed that we were forced to be reckoned with in helping patients. And that was truly a joy to be able to serve the way we did uh -huh. when we were, when we both helped patients together in a collaborative fashion. So, yeah. Yeah. So why don't you start off just letting us know about, I think it's so important for people to hear about how, um, us conventional doctors get into family, uh, sorry, functional medicine. And, you know, why don't you start off letting us know how things um, transpired for you uh, and how your journey uh, occurred? Yeah. So, you know, as a little girl, I had three dreams, you know, I had a dream to be a doctor. I had a dream to one day get married. I had a dream to have children. And that were, those were in that order, probably, or somewhat in that order. And unfortunately, um, a lot of my symptoms led to me uh, almost not being able to achieve any of them. And it was pretty gut wrenching and heartbreaking. And I'll never forget during the, towards the end of my residency, you know, here I am six or eight weeks from finishing. So mm -hmm. after, you know, four years of medical school and th almost three years of residency, I was just couldn't take it anymore. I was so tired, but um, I had already run my labs a million times and I had the stereotypical pattern of what was hypothyroidism, but the conventional doctors would call that normal. And I was too fearful. Can you imagine a doctor being too fearful to see another doctor to be told they're crazy because that's how they labeled you that maybe you're depressed. And mm -hmm. um, so I just plowed through and I just, one day I just hit the wall and I went down into the basement of um, the abandoned quarter of our building that led to the residence lounge. And I sat down on the ground and I cried mm -hmm. I went back up and I promptly announced I'm quitting. I just have had it. I can't take this anymore. I just feel awful all the time. And that residency director was quite compassionate. He just, you know, encouraged me and gave me the cheerleading I needed. And somehow I plowed through and, you know, in this segued into, so I achieved that first goal of becoming a doctor, but even then to get married, if you can imagine, I was like falling asleep left and right, even on dates. So, and I had people like, so I know, can you imagine how many people asked me out on a second date? Um, a rock concert once. So I'm from Cleveland and it was the inaugural rock and roll hall of fame concert. I fell asleep in the middle of a concert. So that's how bad the energy was. And after residency, it took me about three months to even feel somewhat normal of just constant sleep. And so 
Um, so I did manage to stay awake on a more than one date with the same man and we, and at the altar and we got married, but so then we went on to have kids and it was kind of, that's where the journey started. And, I, and then here I was in practice trying to have children and I would see the same pattern. Someone come in with fatigue and I didn't have the answers so much so that I was, I heard a patient say that doctor just doesn't know what's wrong with me. And I was like, oh, you know, like it's not that I don't know. And, but it was true. I didn't know. And I would prep them. I would prep them 99% of the time your labs are in exam are normal. You have to start thinking this is depression. Mm -hmm. And so I wouldn't offer a lot of times people are offered an antidepressant when they came back and their labs were normal. I would never offer that if they, in their heart of hearts, I had great relationships with my patients. If they said they weren't depressed. So I said, something's missing here and something was missing. And I finally found a doctor who had a little bit of integrative training. And he says, you've been hypothyroid for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And it was night and day when I was put on thyroid beds. And so I wish I would have then like uncovered what else was underlying. Cause there were so many things. And then we went on to get pregnant. It was the same thing. We couldn't get pregnant. We were told it was unexplained. So here I have unexplained fatigue to unexplained infertility. And here's me delivering babies. And I just had to like have a big grin on my face. And I genuinely felt happy for all these women. But one day in my clinic, this woman came in and she was pregnant for the eighth time and I should have been happy. And I couldn't be, I couldn't be happy because six of her seven existing children were taken away because she had a cocaine problem. Oh my God. And, grin, <laughs> and I, I, and then I thought something, and I said, if there is a higher being, if there is a God, like what God would do this. And I just, I was just, so I took, I took the bulls um, by the horns and I found a natural means online to how to improve my health. And lo and behold, after multiple failed um, treatments, we ended up getting pregnant and mm -hmm. not once, but twice. And we had the same scenario. I had to fail all this treatment and then say, all right, remember what you did the first time, but it wasn't entrenched in me. Um, and then in my forties, uh, I, so every decade, it felt like I got worse and worse and worse. So I'd recover and then get worse and recover. Um, I started not recovering from jet lag and we were living abroad. So it went from three or four days, maybe a week to two, then to three, then to four weeks, four weeks of not being able to recover from jet lag. That's, that's significant. If it happens to you, it's not normal. And I just happened to have already have found functional medicine. And I was at this booth and the representative was representing glutathione, which is our body's major antioxidant. He right. said, and I said, he goes, Hey, you must be excited to get back to your family. I said, I am, but I'm not looking forward to the fatigue that'll set in. And he says, here, go down to the whole foods, get some melatonin and take this glutathione. So I did. And sure enough, in like three to four days, my jet lag was gone. None of the debilitating non-functional symptoms. And I was amazed, but I didn't know enough. And it wasn't until later. And actually then I went off of it. So here I am in functional medicine and I go off of it thinking, oh, I feel better now and didn't know my genetics and my personal the way I metabolize things. And it turned out I was deficient in missing two full genes that are responsible for the manufacture of glutathione. So I don't have any copies. I remember and, that. I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I didn't even find that out until after um, I developed severe muscle pain and fatigue and abdominal pain. And I was going into liver failure and they didn't know why. And they thought because I had one autoimmune disease, it was autoimmune hepatitis and my enzymes were more than 10 times normal. And I thought we were on a celebratory trip and I was with my kids. No one really knew what was going on. And they were really young and they're jumping into the pool and they're like, you know, they were what they were four and eight. And they're like, watch me, mama, watch me. I'm like, so this is how it ends. I'm going to leave you. You know, I've worked all my life to be a doctor. I finally did that. I got married. I had these two beautiful kids and now I found a field that I really want to train in and I'm going to die. Mm -hmm. Or the, uh, the alternative was, is that if you're not on steroids, um, the mortality rate from autoimmune hepatitis is 50% in five years. Wow. And so I saw the uh, GI doctor and we did go through the motions. Um, I had actually at the same time by the luck, by some luck, I was kind of mildly training with someone online as I waited to get back to the United States to undertake my first job with you in functional medicine. And he took me through a traditional protocol and I did everything he said. 
And it was, and all my numbers were normal by the time I landed in the US, like six weeks later, near normal. And they still wanted to biopsy me. And I never got that diagnosis and never ended up on steroids. And that was um, eight years ago. So clearly I was able to overcome that. And I had the markers for it. So I had the autoimmune markers for it, but reverse the whole process. So, um, and then finding that out the genetics says, you know, this for me, it's not for everyone. Not everyone needs to be on glutathione, but for me, I need at least a dose a day and, and to just prevent that relapse. So that was how that, that was what said, all right, there's a better way. And if I can heal myself, I want to prevent this, right. Yeah. Prevent this in every person. And one, one, just so our listeners know, if you've done the organic acid test through great plains lab, which is a, it, which is one of the tests that I use for a lot of my patients. And I know you do too, that glutathione level is actually on the test. It's on the last page. So if, if you have that, and you know, if you want to see what your glutathione level was at the time of the test, you can uh, look that up on, on the great plains lab organic acid test. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you've been through a lot and I know you've really done a huge deep dive into uh, genetics with your patients and nutrigenomics. Um, we, we were both really doing a lot of that uh, together over at visions healthcare and, um, you, you really took it, you know, to a top level of understanding, um, as compared to me. Um, I have a tendency to use genetics in, as, as the end after I do the gut restoration and dealing with all of the other issues like mold, which we, I hope we talk about a little bit uh, if we have time, but, um, and then using genetics um, as a way to understand if people need to be on supplements long-term if mm-hmm. they continue to have issues. And so, um, yeah, it, it, so tell us more, tell us more about how, um, you know, how things like, uh, brain health, your, you know, how toxins and your genetics might ha- might be connected for you and how your journey continued in terms of toxins. Yeah. So, you know, it was really going on that rabbit hole is like you said that traditional functional medicine approach got about 80% of our patients better. And then 20% of the original 20% or original percentage that couldn't get better in conventional medicine just wasn't responding. And so that's what gave me the next layer. And it was like training and learning multiple protocols and then really finding my own method, like the simply health method and applying that. And I call it the three, uh, the D cube method. So three D's and I'll go through that. But, um, so, you know, we look at as it relates to brain health and even in depression, some environmental toxins are real standouts. And so simple things like pollution are directly linked to an increased risk of developing what we call major depressive disorder. And what the studies have found is that just a small rise in pollution can increase your risk of depression by 43% just by living in a polluted city. And, you know, as you know, in major cities, the uh, pollutant levels will go up and down. And so it just means that if you live in LA for a healthy person, your risk of major depression is increased by uh, greater than or equal to 86%. So that's like, if that isn't startling, then nothing, you know, that really should be. And, And all of these things, I don't know that we have a gene for that, but I think the way to explain the genetics is that we never look at just the genetics. We try to modify and give everyone a healthy lifestyle so we can actually turn off defective genes. And I will agree with you hundred percent, Achina, is that for the most person, most person, you don't even, most people, you don't need to do the genetics. You can um, buy their symptoms and even their labs kind of assume the patterns. It's really astounding when you've been doing it for a while, but in the patient who comes in so chronically ill, you better bet your bottom dollar that they cannot, they're not overriding the mutations that they are actually expressing. That means it's truly being represented in there and what's showing up. And it it really serves them well to know what's going on. So you can not only uh, reverse what's going on, but then keep them there and prevent that progression. So Right. Yeah. Isn't that astounding about pollution? Oh my what gosh. Can- yeah. I actually did not know that. So you certainly taught me something. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's good to know. I mean, it's amazing all the different factors that can cause a mood change that people don't really um, think about. And so it's, you know, as we tell, as I always say, it's foods, infections, toxins, stress, and hormones, because all of those affect your hormones. And I know you could talk for a long time about hormones, but we're going to focus on toxins. Yeah. What else do you have to say about toxins? 
Yeah. So um, the then the second uh, area that can be problematic and linked to depression is exposure to pesticides and insecticides. So our organophosphates. And ironically, there is a test that can measure that. And, you know, I had a family that was eating largely organic, but uh, the adults were and then the children were getting other things in and sky high levels in a young girl who had mental health symptoms. And just pointing out these things like, hey, there is a way to give you a support supplementally to release the, um, the pesticides out of the body, but you are one that really needs to be eating all organic because it will affect the health. So uh, just to know that, so why the importance of organic is that some of us are predisposed and cannot break down those pesticides. And I'll talk about that gene in a moment, but, and, um, and so if that's you, it's been directly linked Uh, So just having um, the exposure is linked to major depression. Mm -hmm. Uh, Now on the gene side, there is a gene, it's called PON1, P-O-N-1, not that I want to make everyone a geneticist on here, but if you have a mutation in that gene that doesn't allow you to break down um, pesticides as readily, and that one increases your risk for not only depression, but um, bipolar disorder Mm -hmm. um, by several fold. And so it's important to know. So then those people really want to be monitored and you know, I had a case of a woman who had um, acute rheumatoid arthritis and she came to me for a genetics consultation. That was what she was scheduled for. And ironically, in between the time she booked and the time she saw me, it was only like four short weeks, she developed acute rheumatoid arthritis. And that was one of her genetic mutations. So what I did was I use your approach that we all do took her through the right order of re, you know, kind of getting her back into balance. And I lost her to follow up. I thought this woman didn't get better or something. And I saw her 18 months later and I said, well, what happened? And she said, oh, I feel like I never had rheumatoid arthritis. And here I'm floored because I don't hear from her. And she was then back for that genetics consultation because she was in fertility and, and was really concerned with her MTHFR mutation, which can lead to increased miscarriages. And I thought to myself, wow, that's amazing. And and then retrospectively, so it means after the fact, I reviewed her genetics and sure enough, she had two gene mutations of PON1. So for her, it's really important she eat organic. And if she can't is to provide her the support. So there are supplemental supports that you can give uh, to allow them to clear that easier. So, right. right. And uh, unfortunately, those supplements supports probably should be taken lifelong, right? Because yeah. we're not, we're, we're not going to be able to change the environment that we live in, I guess, unless you move to the Antarctic or something, you know, do a much clear, cleaner environment. And those cleaner environments are far and few between nowadays. So, so but certainly out of the cities, right? <laughs> certainly out of the cities. And just yeah. to speak to that, you're right. You can't always avoid it. So we do our best, you know, buying organic, buying clean products. And then if you're in a big city, you know, the simple tips are when the air pollution is high outside, don't go outside, have an air filter for your home. And they even make air filters for your car. So if you find yourself right now, everyone's working from home mostly, right. Right. but if you're, you're in that environment, I've thought about this for my husband who travels more than an hour to and from work each day is to get them. They have individualized car filters. Um, you know, there's a company called IQ air. There's many of them. That's one of the several that I really like. Uh, that makes a small uh, atom and it just hangs off the back of your seat and filters the air while you're driving. So that's a simple fix, but um, an easy, a cheap one, obviously is just not to go outside when the air pollution is high and definitely don't be jogging outside when it's hot. So there's apps you can download to know what the, uh, the quality of the air is in your town, by the way. So um, it's important to know that I don't think it's so bad where I live. I'm not so sure where you, you know, if, if I, you're, I know you're close to Chicago, but you're definitely in the suburbs, but yeah. you know, there are apps that you can download um, that can get, provide you that information and not just uh, pollution, but also um, environmental like uh, allergens, you know, mm-hmm. what the mold counts are, what they, um, uh, you know, for hay fever and things like that, uh, seasonal, different seasons, uh, uh, amounts, you know, uh, in the air from the different seasons. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So then you talked a little bit about glyphosate and, um, there's testing that you can do to see what your levels are. What tests do you use I and mean, what, or is there any testing that you typically use for all your patients in terms of environmental toxins? So, 
the generally well or modestly unwell, you know, I'm just taking them through the protocol and we follow symptoms. Anyone who's moderate to severe, it's like there's a right time and place. So if someone comes in and they've got their, they've got complete full-blown dementia, they get the million dollar workup. And the company I use is Great Plains Lab, who's also running the oat test that you had referenced. And they do a GPL tox, and that's just all the environmental toxins and not too terribly expensive, I think a couple hundred bucks. And then the, they do a glyphosate test, which is $99. So pretty inexpensive. And it was really interesting in our family is that we eat all organics. Our kids had really low levels. And my husband and I were approaching the 75th percentile for it. And it's considered uh, significant if it's 95th percentile or higher and we are all organic, but the other thing you don't realize is it's ubiquitous. It's in the air. So it's found in rainwater. And then we live on a golf course community. So it's sprayed in everyone's lawn and it's getting, it's infiltrating the groundwater. And so then I put myself and my husband on, um, there's a product that I like that, um, kind of helps clear, um, the glyphosate, uh, by cell core sciences. So I like the it's H M E T for heavy metals, environmental right. toxins. Right. And so right. that's all you can do is that we're avoiding as much as possible, but surprising, not surprisingly, the rest of our levels were really quite low because it reflected the lifestyle. So that was one, just so people know that, um, you really want to get a whole handle on that. If the sicker you are, the more testing you're probably going to need. So you can pinpoint and remove um, or pinpoint and support. So in our case, we're, we're supporting, we're trying to do both. So yeah, yeah, that's great. I do, I do use the same testing. I wasn't sure if you use something different than Great Plains Lab. And it's a pretty good test. It's yeah. pretty comprehensive. Yeah. Uh, lots I, of chemical names. <laughs> say again? I said lots of chemical names that are on there. So it takes a little while to get a hang of because, you know, we're not environmental a biologist, but we become that way, you know, yes, know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I actually had a patient whose um, levels for um, mosquito repellent were sky high <laughs> oh. uh, and, and it was during the summer and, um, and he uh, also is um, a printer. So he had lots of levels, environmental toxins from his work place um, from two decades of uh, in his workplace, but also a smoker too. So he had a number of uh, a number of sources. Um, so it, it is helpful to get a sense of what your body is dealing with the burden of these toxins and the, uh, you know, the inability uh, to uh, remove these toxins, but it's also thinking about like, what are you putting in your body without realizing it? And so, you know, I can speak for myself in that I, I took off those nails, I you know that, that can be toxic at times and uh, stop using all sorts of lotions and, you know, tons of makeup that, you know, products that are, can be full of toxins. So it's really looking at what you're spraying on yourself, putting on your skin, um, what you're inhaling, some of those air synthetic air fresheners that people have in, in their hallways or their rooms, right? It's really taking a look at your environment and think about what can you actually eliminate and find more natural ways of uh, providing a similar, or do you even need it? You know, like, why is it even there, right? Like those candles, those synthetic candles. I mean, there are some really good candles, but there's also the, you know, synthetic candles. You wanna be careful about what's, you know, what you're putting in your environment. So eliminating those, and there's certainly gonna be things that you are not gonna be able to eliminate. Like you mentioned the air pollution, you can filter them out but then helping your body to detox those, those um, environmental toxins that you really have no control over. Mm, absolutely. And you touch about something, you know, kind of even with our beauty products. So another environmental toxin that's been associated with depression is phthalates. So it's pH. T A L A T A S, I think T E S. Phthalates. 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 So P H A L A T E S. That's it. And so that's found in a lot of the beauty products, and men use hardly anything. But we, by the end of one morning, will have put on 150 different chemicals on our 
our bodies. And so I love, there's two great sites, but I really like the Think Dirty app. So if you go to thinkdirtyapp.com, mm-hmm. it's a free app and you can take pictures of products and it'll give it a toxicity rating. And it's like a stoplight. Green means go, wow. yellow says proceed with caution and red means no go. And it will list if it's got phthalates. And so uh, I was at a popular store uh, I won't name which one. And I had not been in the store for decades because it was more prevalent on the West Coast. I said, wow, I haven't been in here forever. And I love some of their products. And I was looking for a face wash and I scanned it and the little sales rep says, oh, what is that you're using? And I told her and I said, oh, I'm not going to get this face wash. It's got paraben and methyl paraben in it. Like oh, and, paraben, yeah. um, and phthalates both are in that category, along with BPA that can act like estrogen in the body. Um, So forget about the phthalates can cause depression. It can, they can also act like estrogen and cause hormonal imbalances and heaven forbid, we don't know for sure, but the worry is like breast cancer or any hormonally induced cancers. And I said, Oh, I'm sorry. I can't buy this product. I, and she goes, no, that's a good kind of paraben. (laughs) (laughs) And um, sometimes you just got to let that, that go. And um, I said, I don't think, I don't think we can agree on this. That's okay. You know, um, and if I'm there and interestingly enough, you scan stuff, the two things to notice is you can get inexpensive face washes and body products. They don't have to be expensive to be clean. So I use a cure brand for face wash, a C C U R E whole foods. It goes on sale for six 99, uh, every so often it lasts more than two months. So that it doesn't get any more, you know, more affordable than that. Alternatively, even at, just because it's at whole foods does not mean that it's safe I for you. So- totally agree with you. You got to be careful, read labels, read labels, read labels, just because it's at a health food store doesn't necessarily mean that it's actually healthy. So yeah. you got to really be educated about it. Yeah. So uh, Think Dirty is the app that you mentioned. Are they associated with Skin Deep or is it connected to them at all? Totally separate. So what you're referencing for our listeners is that the um, Skin Deep is put up by the Environmental Working Group. And that's my second favorite. So they're both, I like them both for different reasons. So, and I, sometimes if it's not on Think Dirty, I'll look on Skin Deep. I just like um, the user user ability, I guess, of the Skin Deep or the Think Dirty app on my phone. So mm-hmm. it makes it, it's just real convenient. So. Yeah, I actually um, have a really liked products from a company called Beauty Counter, um, which has really nice, um, nice line of cosmetics and uh, creams and things yeah. like that. Something to ch- for people to check out. I am going to actually use that Think Dirty um, uh, app and see <laughs> see what they show. Uh, and I hope I'm uh, uh, pleasantly uh, surprised and not unpleasantly surprised because I've spent quite a money on that uh, company. But uh, I love their activated charcoal soap, which has been really uh, a, a big winner for me. But anyway, um, so well, it's good soap. What was I that? We have that soap as well. It's great. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so we have about 15 more minutes. So we, we have more ground to cover if you're willing, you know, I know there's other toxins that you have uh, wanted to talk about. What's next? What's next is um, one that is not recognized by many. So I wanted to highlight it here is that believe it or not, mold Uh, mold can produce toxins and we're talking the black mold, which doesn't have to be visible and doesn't even have to have an odor to cause a problem. So about uh, up to 30% of the population has a genetic susceptibility to mold illness, what we call mycotoxin illness. And there are some astounding, not only symptoms, but then the aftermath once you're exposed and have the illness. So I've seen everything from uh, fatigue and brain fog are kind of the top two symptoms that seem to come through my door, but unexplained rashes, um, even some allergy like symptoms, um, kind of numbness and tingling that kind of comes and goes, no one can figure out, but anxiety and depression, both. So think about that. So, um, and you may say, well, how would I know? And I'm like, one thing I use clinically is, you know, I always do the traditional approach unless they come to me really sick. If someone is not responding like they should be, that should be your tip off 
that you need to dig deeper. And so I, I don't give them very long, you know, in six weeks, I know how they're responding. So clearly if someone's made no changes, we know that. So they're not going to get a, they're not going to be any different, but if they've really have done uh, even partial changes, I get, I see significant results, 30, 40, 50% improvement in symptoms in four to six weeks, even with a little bit of buy-in, a little bit of change being made. And the more they do, sometimes you get them 80, 90% better in, in a couple of visits, but when they don't, so so you have to first suspect it. And the way you suspect it is, do they have these classic symptoms, fatigue, right. brain fog, um, actually hormonal imbalances, right. so thyroid problems where a patient really wants to get better and not end up on medications. And mm-hmm. I just can't get them up or low hormones when you don't suspect it, like in someone who's twenties or thirties that, cause it'll suppress all your hormone function, maybe even insomnia. So because the mold, um, the mycotoxin itself suppresses our ability to make melatonin. And so those should be tip offs. So first you suspect it. Yeah. And another one that you may not, I I don't know if this is your experience, people who have difficulty losing weight, like they've tried everything and really, really tried (laughs) everything and not losing the weight. Um, Absolutely. And so I have a whole program for that, that works, even if you have mold, because, you know, um, unfortunately, when you have that resistant weight loss, it leads to all other problems. So blood sugar dysregulation and pre-diabetes, diabetes, and it just compounds that fatigue as well. And so that's right. And I, I think my greatest would be brain fog, fatigue, weight, weight loss, resistance, hormonal and mental health. So those five are the big ones that I see when it comes to mold illness. Right. Right. Yeah. And so yeah. then oh, go ahead. You were going to no, go ahead. I want to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> so besides mold, there's other things that are related to mold like candida and sometimes they are seen together. And we talked a little bit before the, before we started recording about how candida and copper are kind of connected too. So uh, sometimes copper high candida, high copper and high oxalates are like this triad of mm-hmm. problems that, you know, that can also cause the body to hold stay and hold on to these things together. Um, they actually are almost like a group of three or four things that keep the body from uh, unloading that burden. Cause you sort of have to hunt, unhinge each of those together. Yeah. You bring up a really good point too. So when you have that triad, so here's what I see clinically. And then I think I want the viewers to, you know, certainly some people that'll be listening have never heard of mycotoxin illness, but if they have symptoms that aren't getting better, it will at least get them to explore. And um, before I dive into the explanation on how to treat and what we're looking at, because there is a right order is that I I still think uh, the best test is doing a urine test to look for the mycotoxins. I don't believe any of the blood markers are valid and they, there's a vision test that can be abnormal. uh, That is a marker for biotoxin. They use the vision test. It's a visual contrast sensitivity test. They used it in the military that were exposed to biological warfare to track their exposure and how sick they were getting, but getting onto like, how do you unpackage this? So if someone has mold, Um, two things happen. It can colonize the gastrointestinal tract with just mold or fungal elements or candida or both. Mm -hmm. And then it also tends to colonize the nasal passageways. And you really need to prime someone's system. So if they're particularly sensitive, you've got to quiet down the inflammation before you even bind the mold or you'll make them very sick. And I see many patients come through my door that that's happened. And then you bind the mold And then only then do you go in for the gastrointestinal overgrowth. And you can tell, usually tell which one they have by the O test. Do they have candida or mold or do they have both? So, um, and then you go after that and you're like you, if you don't treat it along with the mold, you're not going to clear the mold. So the minute you stop binding it and you got candida in their belly that, and the fungal elements in their belly. Uh, those, as you know, the organisms can harbor not only mold, but then heavy metals. And then you're in a world of hurt. It just causes it all to come, come back. So, um, and then as you know, candida causes oxalates, which is the byproduct and some people, and it's so inflammatory. I don't know about you, but it makes people either hyper or it induces anxious. Yeah. Yeah. And then 
a word on the copper. So then you got the, the mold, you got the candida and then copper in and of itself, you can get it. Some people will have genetic variations, how they clear it and how much is free floating in the body. And it's a free floating copper in our bodies. That is the problem. And if it's not genetic, then you have to kind of look to the environment. Is it, are you in a swimming pool all day? Cause they use copper is found in a lot of the chlorinated products. Mm-hmm. Are you drinking out of copper mugs or frying out of copper pan? So I had one woman, she was fine. And I screen people, every person who comes through my doors, I'm screening regardless of the symptoms. Um, so I know where, where they stand because it's huge. And if you have anxiety, and copper is your main issue, you can get resolution of symptoms in 10 to 14 days, Mm -hmm. like that quick. Can you imagine you've had anxiety all your life and someone fixes you in in less than two weeks? Right. So huge. And I'm sure you've seen that too. So yeah. Yeah. And so um, then not only the cups and the pans, but copper water pipes in our home. So, so not everyone's going to have an issue, but you know, it may be, it may be compounding everything that's going on. So my word of the caution is you find a practitioner who knows all of these areas and can do it in the right manner so that you're not made worse um, by, with your symptoms. Right. Right. Yeah. I just want to mention Dr. Reika was trained um, at the Walsh Institute with me. We did that uh, training together. And so we are very familiar with uh, zinc copper balance and ceruloplasmin, which is what binds to copper and keeps the copper out of the serum in a free form, as she talked about. So it's important to get those uh, three lab results when, when we're evaluating something like that. So, yeah. yeah. So we have uh, about uh, five more minutes before I'm going to um, open it up to questions. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to add that you think can like put a little bow around this package of all this information about toxins that you've given us so far? <laughs> um, you know, really it's, if you're fairly well, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming anyone that's listening probably is looking for answers. So, so if you're, you have moderate to severe symptoms is to first avoid and then detect what's there and then uh, find a practitioner that will appropriately support the process. So if you need something to help you gently detox, or you need glutathione, like I did, Mm -hmm. uh, so that you don't, you know, it's a huge thing. And I always tell people it's, you can have a small bucket, a medium bucket, or a large bucket. The large bucket people are like uncle Henry, who smoked uh, 60 years of his life and he dies peacefully in his sleep when he's 95 years old or something. And so that's the rarity. Then you have, most of us are in the middle and I definitely was not middle. So I had a smaller bucket. Mm -hmm. And I, now that I know what I know, I say, boy, it's a wonder I didn't develop um, cancer before now. And so I, I'm grateful for everything I know and want to share with um, listeners um, on the William Walsh. So ironically, just a neat tidbit, I'll share two more facts is he's here in Naperville. Mm-hmm. And so since then, I've developed a lovely relationship with him and, and serve on his advisory board. And he is 85 plus years old, as you know, and still going strong. Oh, my God, he's so <laughs> smart. Yeah. And, you know, completely has his mind. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the other thing is with the mold is that I'd say the biggest word of advice is really do your due diligence and find a practitioner because if you're treated out of order, or if you, especially if someone has heavy metals, I've seen a lot of people come in and they're chelated for heavy metals and their memory tanks, or they're really thrown under the bus and feel worse. Um, because it is so problematic and, you know, I'm one practitioner, I can't serve a million people. I am, if it's okay to mention, I'm, I'm launching a very low cost, um, community called conquering mold. That will be a great first starting point. So kind of be a, um, with uh, weekly Q and A's with me and I'll bring in monthly speakers and I'm going to be holding too many courses on, you know, I've got mold. Where do I go from here? Because if you don't have the foundation in place and sometimes we'll have patients work on foundational items before we even see them. And, right. and, and to the point, and I, I will have as a caveat, we said this to a woman and she actually messaged back and said, are you out of your mind? I can't possibly do this. Or I've done the training and I, it was working on the limbic system. And, uh, 
And she goes, and then we got a a message uh, just now. So not even four weeks later, she's like, I am so much better. I don't need to see you. And (laughs) and I'm glad she's better, but mold, unfortunately, you cannot excrete on your own. Now, certainly there are people who will have mycotoxins, you know, in their urine, but if they're not susceptible, it's not affecting them. And it's for the people who already have symptoms and are sick. And you can actually measure that. So I'd say just caution to the wind is uh, gather the information, find the best fit for yourself, um, and then have it remediated or or treated before it becomes an illness and it's too late. And there is uh, too late. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, there's uh, quite a few patients that I see that have mold and have been treating mold, having them do the VCS testing, uh, that's the visual contrast screening and uh, the mycotoxin testing and environmental toxin testing. And, and, you know, having them uh, treated for mold, even doing the nasal swabs with some patients and getting Marcon's positives and, you know, really doing a whole workup for some people. And then there's others that I have to, you know, refer out because it's, it is to the extent that um, they need to see someone more like you, who's like really seeing a lot of patients with mold and is is a major part of their practice. So yeah, so I'm, you might be having some people coming over your way. (laughs) Glad to help them. Glad to help them always. Yeah. So I, you know, I want to thank you so much uh, for providing us with so much information about how uh, people can develop brain issues and particularly depression um, from environmental toxins and and how the genetics plays a part um, in that as well. So I am going to um, uh, really say uh, thank you for being my friend (laughs) and I'm so (laughs) glad have you on my podcast and uh i look forward to seeing you in person soon <laughs> soon well likewise it, you know my deepest gratitude to be able to share this information and um, pack a punch you know so that people who are listening hopefully they'll, it'll be eye-opening and they can take the right steps to fully get better yeah great thanks 